Hey, uh, turn to your neighbor and say, you were supposed to be here. Now turn to your better looking neighbor and tell him, you were supposed to be here. Yeah, you are supposed to be here. <laughs> I got to tell you, it's been, a, man, it's been a beautiful week uh, in, in the prayer room that's been in the back here in the student center. Um, I started out last Monday with a 6 to 8 in the morning prayer set, and I thought maybe we'd have like five people. I don't know. There was at least 30 there ready to go. And uh, I saw just uh, adult men sitting in chairs, just tears streaming down their face, just loving Jesus, worshiping Jesus. And uh, it's been so beautiful. I want to encourage you, um, if you have have a window that you can jump in on one of these prayer times there we're sending them out there various times through the through the week um, this Wednesday night we're going to be praying and worshiping together devoting ourselves to that I want to encourage you to be here and uh, it's it's so good if you haven't jumped in on the fast guess what you can jump in today tomorrow um, listen to the message from last week if you haven't it'll encourage you and give you some vision man I uh, I am excited about what the Lord has uh, today uh, in what I'm going to share. And, um, you know, I've been thinking about we're stepping into this New Year's. What are we, seven days in? Is today the seventh? Eighth. Eighth. Oh, we're eight days in. Thank you. Um, I think one of the most important realities as we step into the New Year for us is to be present to what we've been made stewards over to be present to what it is that God has given us to steward in our life. Did you know that your life is a gift from God? He gave you your life. He gave you you. You're a gift. Turn to your neighbor. We're going to do this a couple times today. We're waking up and say, you're a gift. Come I know you love it. Some people hate it. Some people love it. Some people refuse to do what I ask. It's okay. You are a gift. You are a gift. You're a gift from God, and every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. And, and, and also, if you are in Jesus, um, you are not your own anymore. If you are his, the Bible says you've been bought with a price, and that price, we sang about it, we, we took communion today, the, that price was the precious blood of Jesus actually bought you. Paid for your life. And if you are his, you are not your own. This is the last one. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are not your own. This is the last one. I prom oh, I don't promise, but <laughs> you are not your own. You are not your own. You're not your own. And, and we have been given stewardship of the life that God has given us. I love this definition of the word stewardship I came across. And it's this. It's to protect Get this, and expand the resources of another. It's to protect and to expand the resources of another. So as we enter into this new year, we have an invitation to begin by giving our attention to what has been given and to steward what has been given. We steward our time. Our, our hours, our minutes that we have been given are precious. We steward our days, our work, our families. We get to steward the gifts that God has given us. We get to steward relationships, right? We get to, we get to manage relationships that he has given us. And guess what? We get to steward our finances. And I want to say today, how we manage money really matters, there are nearly 500 verses on the subject of faith in the scripture. There are over 500 scriptures on prayer. But guess what? There are over 2,000 scriptures in the Bible about finance and money and property. That's a big deal. Jesus talked about money in 16 of the 38 parables that he, he shared. There is an emphasis in scripture on finance and money. And I, I just want to confess this to you. I've been the lead pastor here for about three and a half years. And in those years, I have never taught or talked on this subject before. And I want to apologize to you. I do. I want to apologize to you. But we're going to begin to talk about it today. I was expecting just standing ovation, but it 
didn't have, you know, I really hit it off last week with the fasting. You're like, wow, you hit us with the fasting. Now you're hitting us with the giving. Before that, it was prayer. It's almost like I was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. You know, Jesus, Jesus, you know, he was, seriously, you look in there, uh, uh, Matthew 5, 6, I think it's in 6 there. He, he's like, right in this section, he's like, when you pray, when you fast, when you give. I'm just following Jesus. Okay, you have to take it up with him. Um, I, I want to be really clear, though, about this as, as I jump into this, that um, I'm not talking on this subject today because the, the church is hurting financially. I think that's really important that you understand that. Um, I'm not talking about this today because I'm going to ask you for a big offering at the end of the day. Um, we're not looking for that. I'm not talking to you about this because we've been having difficulty paying the light bill. Um, I'm speaking about finances today. I'm speaking about stewardship because it is a central theme in the kingdom of God. It's a central theme in scripture. And as your pastor today, I want every single one of us to be blessed. And I want every single one of us to be able to enter into all that God has for you in every way, including finance. How many want to enter into all of that? I was thinking about the song we sang today. It's so powerful. It's another Sermon on the Mount. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount with like talking about those who hear and obey, those who hear what I say and do what I say, they're the ones that are building their house on the solid rock, the firm foundation, so that when the storms come and when the winds blow and the things of life come, your house is going to be able to stand. And that is my heart for us as a church, that we're raising up a community and radical lovers of Jesus, that no matter what winds blow, we're able to stand in the midst of them, and our house is secure. And I believe that finances are very central to that. So if you don't keep your finances in order, and you don't come into the order of God with finances, you may, you may not even have a house. Anyways, that's a different story, but... Um, in Matthew chapter 25, we're going to start there today. Jesus shares parables about the kingdom of God. And here's what we need to understand about parables. Parables give us pictures. Jesus gives us pictures in parables about the kingdom, what it's like. And there's, there's no one parable that paints a full, complete story, but each one shows us different detail, right, that help us to grow that help us to understand the realities of the kingdom of God. So just like there's no one scripture in the Bible that tells us everything about God, because it takes the whole Bible to read the Bible, right? Many times in, in his teaching, though, Jesus would start a parable with the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. And, and what he's doing here is he's letting us in on the nuances and, and, and the beauty of what the kingdom is like. And as followers of Jesus, as you know, um, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're not, man, we would love to pray with you and talk with you about that at the end of this service, truly. Um, but as followers of Jesus, we're called to live in the kingdom of God. Yes, you live in the United States. Yes, you live in Missouri. Yes, we are here in Springfield today. I live in Springfield. But as followers of Jesus, we're called to live from the realities of another kingdom while we live here in this place. And as we get this, as we learn the realities of that kingdom, and then we release them and we bring them here on earth as it is in heaven. So what, what, what are we talking about through these parables? I'm learning his way. I'm learning what the kingdom order is, and then I bring that order here, right? Like, like how many know the world needs the order of the kingdom of God? And so does my life, and so does your life, and so does our city, and so does our church. And so through my life, when that order comes and I begin to live in the kingdom, everything I touch, I get to release that there, and I believe the primary way that we do that is through the stewardship of our lives. And it's for every single one of us. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. So here in Matthew 25, Jesus is teaching us how this stewardship works in the kingdom of God. Now, I've been, I'll just tell you this, I've been personally really challenged as I prepared for today 
And um, I, I believe we're all going to be challenged. Are you ready to be challenged? Yeah, I hope you've come to be challenged. I hope you didn't come to phone it in today. I hope you came to your flesh to get offended so that your spirit can rise up and lead you. Yeah. So Matthew 25, we're going to jump in at verse 14 here. And Jesus is talking about the kingdom. And he says this. He says, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Everybody say his property. His property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents, get this, went at once and traded with them. And he made five talents more. In other words, he, he grew. He went immediately to grow what God had given him. In fact, he doubled what God had given him. So also, he who had two talents made two talents more. He also doubled what God had given him. But verse 18, it says, He who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, it's important to understand, I think, the largeness of, of what, what we're talking about here, the largeness of what they were given here. And as I, as I dug into this, I, I, I had studied this before, but I kind of I dug in again. One talent was equal to about 20 years' wages. One talent is like 20 years' wages. Two talents is like 40 years' wages. Five talents is like, uh, you do the math, 100. Um, so let's just say, and there's different numbers out there about this, but let's just say you make, let's say you're, you're the guy in the parable, and you make $50,000 a year. I, I don't know what you make. You could do the math in your own. I'm just taking 50 because it's easy math. How many need easy math? Um, 50,000, okay. You make 50,000 a year. So one talent, like 20, it was 20 years wages. So this guy got almost a million dollars. Second guy, he got like two million. No, the two talent guy got two million. The five talent guy got like five million, right? I can, I can add, I promise. <laughs> In other words, the point that I'm trying to make is that these guys were entrusted with a lot of resources. I mean, this is big time resource. In verse 19, it says, Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled the accounts with them. Jesus is letting us know right here that there will come a day for the settling of accounts with him. There will come a day when we stand before the Lord and we give an account for all that we've been given. For all that we've been given. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. He doubled it. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I'm going to set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Doesn't that sound amazing? It's like what we quote at all the funerals and everything. Hundred, hundred, hundred years wages isn't a little. I mean, we're, you know, five million dollars. He says, you've been faithful over a little? Think about that. The master's saying, you were faithful over a little. Hundred years wages. That's not little to me. Right? You were faithful over a little. Can you imagine what the master God must imagine is like really important? And he also, verse 22, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. Get this. He says, so I was afraid. 
And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. Now listen, you read this and you you think about this. this. This man that was given the one talent who went and hid, he had absolutely no reason from what we know in this story to know the master as a hard man. He had no reason to know God as a hard master. In fact, the master was extremely generous, don't you think? God God is extremely generous. Oh, there was like two amens on that. God is extremely generous. He is kind. He is trusting. He is trusting like he believes in these servants. He is trusting. He gave the guy a million dollars. Think about this. He's, he's patient. He gave him a long time. He wasn't like, hey, I'll be back tomorrow. Make as much as you can. He was gone a long time. And because of it, he had entrusted to this man um, this money. And, and I, I jumped ahead of myself. I wanted to jump back to something I, I wanted to say. There, there, was, there was no specifics on what the master told them, but clearly there was an expectation. There was an expectation. And yet this man with the one talent has a wrong view of God. And because of it, he says, I knew you to be a hard man. I was afraid, and I went and I hid. Does that sound some familiar to something else? I was, I, as I was reading that, I just was brought back. I, 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 I was afraid and I hid. I knew you as a hard man. I was afraid and I hid. It sounds like Adam in the garden, right? I, I was naked and afraid. God was calling him. I was naked and afraid, so I hid. God says to Adam, right, who told you you were naked? And it's like, it's like in this moment, I feel like, it's like, who told you, guy with the one talent, that this is who God was? Here's this, this, this guy believing his master is to be a hard man. I love what Tozer says. Tozer says that, that what you think about God is the most important thing about you. Wrong views and lies that we believe about who God is almost always result in us being afraid and hiding in some way. And then not becoming and not releasing all that he intended from our lives. That's why what we're doing here by even fasting negativity and fasting lies and grabbing lies and replacing them with truth in this fast is so stinking important. It's so important. Because what we believe about God determines what we're going to do with what we've been given. We see it in the parable. So he says to the master, here, have what is yours. He hands him back the talent. He hands him the the bag of gold, exactly how he'd received it. But his master answered him and said this, you wicked and slothful servant. I read that. I'm like, that's a little intense, master. Like, it, it's, it, you know, this guy didn't go and blow the money, right? It's not like he went on a, a, a spending spree. It's not like he went out and bought a yacht. Do you know what I mean with the, with, the, with the master's money? Yet the Lord says, you're wicked and you're lazy. Why? I believe it's because of this, because there is no neutral in the kingdom. There is no neutral in the kingdom. There is no staying where you are in the kingdom. There is advancing and there is digressing. It's true for you. It's true for me. It's true for all of us. And there is always a response that is required to steward what has been given. And what has been given to you? Everything. Who we know him to be. Who we know the Father to be directly impacts how we steward what he's given us. The master says this, verse 26, he says, You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. 
And at my coming, I should have received what was mine with interest. So the master says, take the talent from him and give it to him who had the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Whew. That's sobering. That's sobering. That's, and it's powerful, isn't it? He says, take the talent and give it to the guy with the ten talents. Why? I believe it's because Jesus takes seriously what he entrusts with us. Jesus takes seriously what he entrusts with you. And I want to say this to you today. Don't think what you have is too little based on what somebody else has. Because the challenge is be faithful with what you have been given. The guy who had, had two and the guy who had five were both given the same well done. So think about this. It's not about the amount. It's about the stewardship, and it's about the faithfulness to what you've been given by God. And what I want to suggest to you today is that, that everything that you have is God's. Some of us are like, yeah, that's really basic, Josh. I think, though, that that's not how most of us think, that everything you have is God's. It's not yours. He gave it to you. You think about it. When you walk back into your house today, it's not yours. You walk back into your apartment today, it's not yours. You go to your job tomorrow, it's not yours. You step into your car to drive out of here, that car isn't yours. Your bank account isn't yours. Your, your everything isn't yours. It's his. And what I, what I believe this parable is saying to us is that, that, that we're called to steward. We're called to protect and expand even what he has entrusted to us. And it's not just about what you're going to do in the future, because oftentimes we think about that. One day we'll do this. One day we'll do that. No, it's about what will you do right now with what you have been given right now. It starts today, and we often miss how the, how the kingdom works because we imagine, you know, when God is moving and calling us to things bigger and better. But I want to tell you, the kingdom always comes in seed form, little seeds. And he says, what are you going to do with those little seeds that I've given you? Because when you're faithful over a little bit, he is going to set you over much. If you're not faithful with $500, why in the world would God give you $5,000? Am I offending anyone yet? Come back next week. It'll be better. My wife's preaching. <laughs> and this is the way that God has worked from the very beginning in the garden. What do you think of when you think of God? This is really important. I know this is very foundational, but I feel like this is important for us right now. What do you think of when you think of God's first command in the garden to Adam? Many would say, the first command was, don't eat from the tree. But that wasn't the first command. And it's important that we understand this too, because if you think God's first command to his first man is don't, it'll impact who you know God to be. He is, <laughs> he is, he is not first a no God. He is not first a no God. These right here were the first words that God gave to man. Genesis 1.28. God blessed them. God blessed them. Do you know that this has been the desire of God from the very beginning in the garden to bless his people? It has been his desire from the beginning to bless his people. His desire is to bless you, to bless your life. And we have to refuse every other thought that doesn't line up with this truth. Verse 28, God said to them, be fruitful. This was the command. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Like, and if... if if Adam had believed God's first command, he would never have been tempted with his second command. 
You think about that. Not to eat of the tree. See, when we walk in God's divine order for our life, there is blessing. I'm not talking about some name it, claim it, prosperity gospel. Some of you already, those little worries are going up. I want to tell you, that's not who we are here. I'm not talking about getting rich in the world so you can live for the pleasures of the world. Can I hear an amen on that? That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about us as kingdom people walking in the divine order and the blessing of the kingdom of God through faithfulness to him. See, if Adam had walked in God's yes, he would never have had to walk in God's no. And it's true for us. God, God cares very much about stewardship, so much that it is his plan from the very beginning for man to steward all that was his, and it's still his plan. But I, get, I tell you this, when we think that everything that we have is ours, we miss it. That's where we go wrong. But when I look at everything that I have is his, I'm able to see the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The fullness thereof, everything is his. So I want to talk about giving. I want to talk about tithes and offerings and sacrificial giving. Cue the shouts. Okay, they didn't work. <laughs> so I read this book years and years ago uh, called The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. He's a pastor in Texas. And um, uh, I, I read that book, and it really impacted my life. I encourage you to get it if you don't have it. Read it. I've read it several times over the years, and it's really a go-to. So much in that book has taught, has influenced me, and it's, it's part of what's coming out of me today, okay? So I want to I get real basic here for a couple minutes, and I want to just say this. The tithe is the tenth, okay? The tithe is 10%, and in that 10% represents the whole, it represents the all. It's the first. It's the first dollar that you spend. So we're going to do a little math again. If your check is $100, the tithe is 10. If your check is 1,000, the tithe is? You make a million, it's? You're good. If you make 1,000 and you give 50, it's not a tithe. It's not a tithe. Because the tithe is specific to the amount that God has provided. We, we see this principle even in the Garden of Eden from the very beginning. All of this is yours. Eat of it. Except for one thing. And even there it reminds us that we are not owners, but we are stewards. And managers of what is our father's. So every time you give that first 10%, you're like, yes, he gave me 90 to work with. <laughs> you gave me all that. Like the problem is, is if you think that you did that, then you get messed up. But if I'm like, he gave me 100% of what I have. He's asking back that I would honor him with the first, but he gave me 90%. Why do we get hung up on 10? It's like it's the greatest deal in the world. Like what, what boss is like, I'm going to give you 100%. You do whatever you want, and I want just 10% back. Anyways, I thought that was better than your response, but... Um, <laughs> I'm not looking for responses. Yes, I am. Okay, let's be honest. I'm a worship leader, so like, you know, anyways, love to worship together and preach together. So where was I? Okay, so the tithe originated with Abraham in Genesis 14, and I wish I could give more time to this, but Abraham gave a tenth of everything it says there to Melchizedek, the priest of God, which is a whole other thing that's connected with Hebrews, which is a, a day in itself of teaching. And we see also that Abraham's grandson, Jacob, tithes. And what we see is in Genesis 28, 28 Jacob has an experience with God and says, surely this is the house of God, and he tithes. Verse 22 he says this, he says, he says this to the Lord, and of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. 
So in other words, he's like, he recognizes that God gave him everything. Of all that you've given me, I'll give you a full tenth. Jacob's vow to tithe, get this, it came out of his grateful heart. It didn't come from a legalistic mindset. It came from a heart of gratefulness to bless the Lord. And I think it's also really important to realize that this was 400 years before the law. Yeah. Tithing was before the law. We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> Exodus 13. Okay, the Lord said to Moses, I don't have the verse up there because I'm just kind of paraphrasing it. Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Set apart for the Lord all the, that first opens the womb, whether it's an animal or it's a male. It says, they shall be the Lord's. They shall be the Lord's. I don't know if they have the right one up there, but that's what it does say. Somewhere in there. Exodus 23, jump there, verse 19. This is what it says. It says, the best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. In Leviticus chapter 27, I'm just doing a quick little overview here. God was giving instruction to the Israelites on how to prosper in the land of promise. He was instructing them, here's how you're going to prosper in the land of promise. Verse 30, every tithe of the land, that was their income. They made, they made their, their living off the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. He says, it is the Lord's. That first part, that first fruit, it is holy to the Lord. The first is the Lord's, and it is holy. I'll tell you this, when you have a revelation of this holy thing that we get to do, this reality, you won't want that 10% left in your bank account. You will not want to debit that bank account for your vacation or your clothes or anything else. You will recognize it as holy and want to give it to God. <laughs> Am I scaring you? Man, I'm passionate about this because you know what? I wish somebody would have taught me this earlier on. I'm sure my mom did. She's here, but I don't remember. <laughs> I bless you, mom. Um, I wish I, 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 did not, I did not learn this early on. And it impacted my life in a very negative way early on in my life. Here's what we have to realize. We have to realize that everything you have is from God. I'm going to say that about a hundred times in this message. You say, well, I made that money. Okay? You say, I built that company. You say, I, I, I went to school. I did that hard work. I, I, I ask you, who gave you the ability for all of that? Who gave you the ability? Who gave you the gifts that you have? Like, who decided that you were going to be born here in America and not in some jungle in the middle of nowhere? Who decided that you would not be born in some back alley of some third world country where you would have had a different kind of a life, but you were born here and you were given the resources that you have here? That's from God. That's where the American dream differs with the kingdom dream. It is from God. We are not self-made people. We are God-made people. We are God-made people. Everything you have, he gave you to manage. And he says, set apart for me the first of what you earn. It's mine and it's holy to me. Giving the first is me saying, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the tithe is an opportunity we get to give. It's a form of worship. And if it doesn't work for you in the first month, Dan will give you your money. He said it last week. Raise your hand a little higher so they can see you. You had to be there to know what we're talking about, sorry. Say this, if you have something to give, it's because God has given it to you to give. We're blessed to get to do this. Like some of you say, well, that's Old Testament, Josh. First of all, the Old Testament's the Bible. 
<laughs> right? Don't worry, we'll get, we'll get into the weeds a little bit more on it here, I think. Hopefully, the Spirit leads me. But before we jump into a few New Testament scriptures, jump over with me to Malachi chapter 3. And here, the Lord is addressing Israel through the prophet Malachi. I'm telling you, I know that there's resistance in the room to what I'm talking about today. I just know that that's going to be. And I, I, want you to, I want you to, like right now, in that resistance, instead of doing this, go like this to him. To him. Don't even do it. You can be like this to me. I mean, don't punch me or anything. But inside, go like this to him. Because he's the one that's going to do this in you. Okay? So Malachi chapter 3. Israel's being addressed by the Lord through the prophet. And I, I, I'm just going to read the first three mes- verses in the message. I love how it reads. The Lord says, you've, you've had a long history of ignoring my commands. You haven't done a thing I've told you. And this is so beautiful. He says, return to me so I can return to you. Says the God of the angel armies. Return to me so I can return to you. You know what I hear in that? The desire of God for relationship. The desire for God for us to know him in this realm. You ask, but how do we return? Verse 8, begin by being honest. Do honest people rob God? But you rob me day after day. That's what God is saying to them. Jump back over to the the ESV guys up there. You say, how have we robbed you? He says this, in your tithes and contributions in your offerings. There's a distinguishing between actually tithes and offerings. Tithe is the tenth. Offering is above and beyond. Actually, when you're tithing and you give that 10%, it's actually not an offering. According to Scripture... He says, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And that's like some serious stuff. I, I heard somebody say this recently. That, that, that they were robbing God of being able to bless them. Think about that. The way they were robbing God was that he couldn't bless them the way that he wanted to. <laughs> like, they were, they were under a curse. Did you know that God doesn't want to curse anyone? God, he's not willing that any should perish. You think about perishing in terms of, like, eternity, but there's perishing that's happening in the world right now. There's, ha- there's perishing, financial perishing that happens in the church that God does not want for his kids. He's not willing that it, God is a blesser. And they were robbing him of the opportunity of releasing blessing on them. Church, these are promises for our lives that he has. There are promises that God has for our lives, but we have to come into agreement with them. All through scripture, you see it over and over. You you do this and I'll do this. Return to me and I'll return to you. We're not earning. We, salvation is a gift. We're not talking about any of that. We're not earning the love of God. I say this with fasting. I say this with prayer. But there is a positioning of our lives to live in the blessing of God in finances. Verse 10, he says, get this. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. 
That's dancing material there. This isn't, this is, again, this isn't some promise of riches or promises of provisions to get rich and, and live in luxury and all of that. No, 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 no. This is Jehovah Jireh, my provider, the God who will provide, declaring this. Here's the thing. Under normal circumstances, testing of God is a sign of faithlessness. Testing God's a sign of faithlessness. But, but in this case, the tithe, God allows Israel to test him. <laughs> He's like, test me. Try it. Try it. And he offers these three promises. See, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you, pour down blessing, rain so there is no more need. In other words, I'm going to make your crops grow. Regardless of the weather. Regardless of the drought, I'm going to make your crops grow. The next one, verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. What is he saying? He's saying he's going to remove the obstacles of abundance. Then verse 12, it says, then all the nations will call you blessed. For you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, the blessing on them is going to be so noticeable that people outside of their immediate circle are going to recognize the blessing of God in their life. This is the promise. And I want to tell you today, these promises are ours. How do we know this? How this whole thing started out was God saying this in verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. This, what he's laid out here, is the order of God. This is how he operates. But I'll tell you this, these promises are not a way for us to try and control God either. I want to be really clear on this. Our posture isn't, well, I, I did this, I gave um, you know, I, I paid my tithes, I gave an offering, so, so you have to make it rain, God. Don't hear that, because that's not how this works. Also, it doesn't mean if you have $500 to tide you over for the next 10 days and you go buy a $400 grill and ask God to rebuke the devourer, that's not the devourer. That's stupid. People say, you can't fix stupid. I actually believe God does. Can I get a witness? I know there's more witnesses in the room to that than just you all. Our tithes and our offerings aren't to control them. Don't hear that a bit. They are to worship and to thank him. To say thank you for all that I have. To say thank you for mercy and grace. To say thank you for all the blessings you have given me, big and small. They are to say thank you for your grace. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is, this is where the tithe comes from. You gave me everything and I'm offering everything back to you. The first. This isn't an opportunity to manipulate him. It's an opportunity to offer our entire lives as a living sacrifice. Some of you might be here, you might say, Josh, but we're under grace, we're not under the law. And I say, yes and amen. Yes and amen. But see, many believers actually don't understand what grace is and how it operates. You see, the, the righteousness of grace always exceeds the righteousness of the law. That deserved a really big amen. It just does. Grace now empowers what you're willing to do. Matthew 5, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. Every time Jesus points, hear this, this is really important for, for us. Every time Jesus points to an Old Testament law, he then sets a higher standard in the new covenant of grace. The law says, don't murder. Jesus says, don't even be angry with your brother. The law says, don't commit adultery. Jesus says, don't even look at a woman with lust in your heart. 
So if you've taken the theology, I don't tithe because I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. I say yes and amen. Because giving according to grace means it's actually going to be way more than 10%. I'm not kidding. You think I'm just saying, I don't want your money. The church is doing great. Do do you hear me on this? I need you to know this. I am not saying this because I want a raise. It doesn't even work that way. No, I mean, I get plenty of blessing. That's not what I meant. I meant like it just like the board determines all of that. And but but what I'm saying is that I want this for you. Do you you hear that today? I, as your pastor, want this for you. I feel like I'm like, test him in this and see what happens. See the blessing that's going to come to your life. See the worship that's going to explode from your heart. See the transformation that's going to happen on the inside of you. See the legacy that you're going to leave your kids. See what's going to happen with your finances. I love, I love I teach my kids about tithing. And I love it because I don't look at your records, but I look at theirs. I do. I'll look at their boyfriends too. (laughs) I think Robert Morris said it like, if you're not going to take care of what's God's, how are you going to take care of my girl? That got, whoa. (laughs) Oh, this is my time to sing now. (laughs) I need to make everyone happy now. (laughs) Oh my gosh. My wife's like, wrap it up, wrap it up, wrap it up. Here's the thing. When you encounter the grace and the goodness of God and the revelation of what he's done in you, your giving is going to go through the roof. I want my giving to go through the roof. I struggled with this early on. Hey, I want to tell you, if you're struggling and you're not doing well in this area, guess what? It's a new day. Don't be under condemnation. Don't sit here for a second and be condemned in any of this. Take a step of faith. Open your hands to him and see what he will do. Charity is playing so beautifully, but I'm not stopping. I got like three more minutes. Do you have a good like kind of gospel given to the Lord song. I know she does. She grew up in that. Bringing the gospel back. Yeah. Um, Gosh, guys, I'm losing it. We needed joy. (laughs) I'm going to turn into a televangelist now. Oh, I'm just kidding. Give your money. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Somebody get the offering plates. I'm just kidding. This is not that at all. So be free from all that. If you've been wounded by that, be free from it. That's not happening in this house. You might get spanked by the pastor, but we're not manipulating people. There are days I wish we were not live streaming. For all those people at home, I'm sorry. You had to be there. Here's what I want to say. The sacrifices of the New Testament church met or exceeded the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Jesus calls the rich young ruler to sell everything to follow him. Mary took this oil that was a year's wages, poured it on the feet of Jesus. I've never given a year's wages. The New Testament church is all about radical giving. There's tithes, there's offerings, and there's sacrificial giving. Can I just read you one really special little thing? I just happened to read yesterday. It's been so long since I read it. It's out of Mark. I didn't even give him the notes. Mark 12, verse 41. Jesus sat down opposite of the treasury. It's like he was sitting in the back where Paul Harris is by the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, 
Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put everything she had in. All she had to live on. That is sacrificial giving. And it's beautiful. I'm going to close with the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he said, Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth or rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Get this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jump down to 24. No one can serve two masters. For for either he'll hate one and love the other or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The spirit of man then. Money will try and rule you. Have you ever experienced this? The spirit of money will try and have you worship it instead of worshiping the one true living God. And the only way to get free from it is by generosity and giving to God. It'll break you free from the love of money. Here's what I say. What we do with what we've been given matters. And there is order. And I'm not putting you under law. This is about what we get to do, not what we have to do. Giving has to do with the heart, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And how we handle money reveals what matters to us. We can say, you can say whatever you want with your lips about what, where our treasure is, but you know what? You gotta look at the bank statement to know. I was reevaluating our finances recently and I was surprised. There were some things that the Holy Spirit pointed out to me that need to shift. Have you ever had that moment? But I had to pay attention to the statement in order to know. And then I had to call my wife about it. It's that Amazon thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding, baby. I'm totally playing. Do you know what I'm talking about? You got to go back to the statement. You actually got to go look over it. What if you went in your bank statement today or tomorrow and you said, Holy Spirit, show me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to do. Arrange the priorities of my life and my finances around your priorities and what's important to you and your heart because I want to be a living sacrifice in all the ways and I want to steward everything you've given me in the best way, because I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant.